Okay, no, you can start. Oh, we're on the air, starts. folks. We're on the air. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is the Ordinance Committee meeting for Thursday, February 21st. Um, could you take roll call for me, please? Councillor Hamill? Here. Councillor Foley? Here. Councillor Caterino? Here. And uh, Councillor Johnson has graced us. He's sitting in the audience. He didn't want to sit with us up here, and I don't blame him. <laughs> uh, can I have approval of the minutes from January 17th? Move approval. Second. All in favor? Anybody from the public wish to comment on anything on this agenda? Seeing none, we'll move forward. All right, item five was brought to us by uh, Councillor Hamill. Uh, it's discussion on site ordinance of butter notification. And Dawn, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you very much. And thanks for adding this to the agenda. Yep. Um, this goes back a little while ago. Um, it involved uh, uh, clear cutting around uh, the Bailey Seafood Restaurant on Route 1. Oh, right. uh, we received a letter from uh, Mr. Letter. Thomas Michaud on Blue Point Road. Oh, Blue Point Road, yeah. yeah which is yeah. right at the corner yeah. there. And um, uh, I'm not going to read the letter, but I thought I might paraphrase parts no. of it. Um, but basically, he was uh, writing to complain about the, fa the alleged failure of the planning board to represent the interests of the town as expressed in the site planning ordinance. Uh, there uh, was uh, significant clear cutting, uh, which was conducted uh, by the owners uh, of, of the restaurant, Bailey's. Um, a lot of this was old growth, tall pine trees. Um, they're going to be expanding, I, I think, uh, as I understand it, an area uh, for seating called the Grove uh, near the near the restaurant. Nope. No. No. Well, Sorry, you want to let him finish well, his, and then I'll let you get up, and you can yeah. and, and you can talk speak, about. I'll correct you. <laughs> yeah, let's not day. let this get out of hand now. Come on. So, yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> And I have an editorial on that, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the person complained about the lack of notification and, and, um, and raised an issue with, uh, uh, you know, shouldn't there be a, an obligation of um, the owner uh, to notify a butters be, before, you know, implementing uh, changes, you know, on the site? Uh, you know, as I understand, where ordinances do not require us to notify butters. Um, but in my own experience, uh, where we had to tear down and a rebuild of some property in Pine Point, we, as a courtesy, notified butters uh, of the, the plans before uh, uh, before we started construction. Um, and <coughs> the show also went on to raise questions of a, you know, um, the loss of the mature trees, uh, the, you know, uh, raised an issue of, uh, they, you know, they had served as a buffer uh, in an area that uh, was, you know, residential, but also, uh, and also he talked in terms of this being uh, an irretrievable loss for the neighborhood in the town. Um, and he, he referenced here um, uh, a clause from the uh, site plan submission um, so we followed up on this. Actually, I had conversations with Mr. Michaud, uh, as did uh, Councillor Johnson, um, uh, and we said we would, you know, discuss this, you know, as a, a potential matter for uh, okay. follow-up and, and okay. possible action uh, with the ordinance. Committee. Okay. So that's how we're here. And, and Jay, go ahead. Yeah, if I could hear from planning. Yeah, you got to take that. Yeah. I, I apologize. That's all right. We just want to see you. No, yeah, do it however you you'd like. You know, like Frank Sinatra. Or <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's a little weird. So the only, uh, the only slight uh, uh, adjustment to your statement is, and I don't want to get too focused in on sort of one particular project because we're really right. talking about a bigger thing, but the only thing I do want to correct sort of is when the planning board did review the project, they were very explicit about because they weren't requesting additional seating or expanded seating, that this area was not to be used for additional seating, and so that's sort of an okay. explicit condition of approval. Now, not to say they're not going to come in. We actually have a pretty good uh, feeling that they probably will come in for an expansion to the restaurant at some point. But anyway, so thank you. Just, just to, 
Um, so let's see, I, I did do, so just a couple of, um, just a little bit of background. So we do require not uh, a butter notification for a number of things in town. So anyone who's going to the Board of Appeals mm -hmm. uh, is required to uh, notify their butters for pretty much any application that goes before them. Uh, projects that go through a plan development review process um, through the planning board is required to notify butters within 500 feet and subdivisions are required to notify butters um, within 500 feet and I should also say that contract zones yeah. something I'm going to talk about in a moment as well as well as amendments are required to uh, notify uh, butters but in our site plan review standards we don't have any requirements for that um, that's not wholly uncommon, but it's definitely not the norm. I'd say most communities around us do have site plan notification requirements somewhere between direct abutters and 500 feet. Um, I would say the only community that in our research does not, I think, if I remember right, yes, Bitterford is the only one that also does not require, but we looked at a number of other communities and they all have some I'd like, to, I'd like to add to this. There was also some email traffic between, uh, I think, Jay and Tom Hall and Mr. Michaud, you know, to address the issues, you know, the planning board process. And there was, it was pretty clear they followed exactly what they, mm -hmm. they were required to do. So there was no, you know, there was no issue there with what the planning board did. Mm -hmm. um, but it raises a question, you know, here, for Pine Point, you have old growth pine trees, you know, that are related you know, they're descended from the trees that were there from the mass trade. I mean, these are, you know, very old trees that are ir irreplaceable. Um, and no amount of money can replace a mature tree. So there's, you know, there definitely are, are character issues raised in terms of the effect of uh, the cutting, as well as, uh, you know, <coughs> issues around the, you know, heritage mm -hmm. and the natural resources of the town. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one could make an argument, you know, a uh, comprehensive plan argument. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought it was not just because I'm a resident of Pine Point, but because it just seemed like it, it knocked around and uh, was an issue worth our having a conversation about. Okay. Katie, Next do you step. have any questions or comments? A question for Jay. Um, so you said, can you name the three, or the, the ones that do require? So Board of Appeals. Okay. Is that Zoning Board of Appeals? CBS. Yes. Yep. Yeah, CBS. Yeah. Uh, plan development processes and subdivisions and also contracts. And are they all within 500 feet or uh, so are they board, all a little different? Zoning board is direct abutters um, and then the others are 500 feet. Actually, no, nope, that's not true. Um, <laughs> plan development and subdivisions are 500 feet and contract zone is abutters. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's the only question I have comments on. That's the only question I have. Okay. I, I don't have a question per se. Well, Actually, I'll ask this question. <laughs> All right. Um, as a private property owner, I can go and I can cut down any tree I want on my property as long as it's on my property. Is that correct? Generally correct, yes. Okay. I say generally because if you right, have weapons of, and so on right. and such forth, but yes, right. generally right. Correct. And how do you know as a planning board if it's in wetlands or not, and if a property, because I know we've had people come forward saying, oh, my neighbor took down all the trees, or blah, blah, blah. So when someone comes in for a site plan or subdivision, we right. know because they've had to inventory right. their property. And maybe this would be an opportunity for Brian Monstaff, our zoning administrator. He, he really deals with more of the individual resident properties that um, mm -hmm. cut trees. And I know there are some regular, you know, can still cut trees within wetlands. It's just a matter of fill and disturbance and those sorts of things. Right. So I don't know, Brian, do you want to chime in a little bit on that? All I'd add to that is that, um, as Jay said, wetlands and shoreland zoning. Right, there are that's right. limitations on what you can right. do. But generally speaking, you're correct. You own the property. You have right. the right to cut your tree. Right. Um, and nothing will raise the ire of your neighbors that's correct. than cutting a tree on your property. That's right. I see it in real estate. That's why I bring it up. <laughs> Katie, you had. Um, 
Well, I, you know, it sort of occurs to me, I, I mean, I, if you drive that road frequently, which I do, um, I 100% uh, empathize and understand uh, with Mr. Michoud and why he's feeling that way, because it's a s dramatic change um, there in that right. spot. But I also fully respect the private uh, right. ownership rights. So I guess I'm always looking for a win-win, as we do in real estate, right? <laughs> like we try. We, we try. <laughs> like, what would would there have been anything? I, I'm curious to know what the purpose was of the cut. I know that's yeah. not our, necessarily our purview to know that, but I'd be curious to know that. Um, is there anything that we could do um, within our parameters or any language changes that would help a situation like that in terms of the communication piece, like informing? I think part of it is when nobody likes to be surprised except for on Christmas or their birthday, right? So there, is there a way to, to buffer things so that we're not, something like this doesn't happen? So I guess that sort of seems like there's two conversations uh -huh. going. One, we're talking about sort of notifications for site plans in general. Yeah. And right. then I'm starting to hear another conversation, maybe interest around buffering standards, which we do have buffering standards in our site plan review ordinance right. and there's standards for different buffering standards between commercial uses and residential uses, all of which this plan board sort of applied. Um, so again, you know, if we sort of want to drill into that direction, we certainly can, but I think, you know, to, to the point, to your point uh, about sort of a, what's the, how could we sort of communicate what's happening? I think that's where the, the notification through Butters could make that useful. So Butters can at least have the opportunity to come in and say, hey, I'm concerned about these trees. And that, that does help inform the planning board in terms of, because some of the standard, you know, they talk about maintaining trees, you know, where feasible or, or right. ensuring there's a dense stand of trees. Well, what's a dense, what's that mean? And, it, it, and a lot of times it's, con it's context sensitive. I mean, it can mean a different thing between my property to Don's property as right. between your property. So um, I do think that's where providing that public notification and opportunity for the public to at least speak before the board say, hey, I'm worried about this. Right. The board can then say, okay, that's right. so noted. And but, but the difference to mm -hmm. me, and this is just, this is where I'm coming from with this, is was Bailey's did they have a requirement under whatever they've got their business operating for to, re to maintain that buffer? So and do we, and this is my yeah. second part, and I'll ask three. <laughs> the second part is, um, if it were a private property owner, is this the same burden? And the third part is, what is it, what is covered by other towns who have this so-called notification? Are they including private property or is it just commercial? and development uses. All right, I'll try to answer all, all right. of those. So, and I'm glad you, you brought up one I wanted to bring up earlier. So it's important in, 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 you know, for, should be noted that site plan ordinance applies to basically all commercial development. Doesn't apply to single family homes. Right. So when a, so using the example we've been using, they had an approved site plan for 20 plus years. Right, mm -hmm. and they came in and said we want to change, we want to cut down these trees. We said, well, that's a site plan amendment. So them, so because it's a commercial site that has an approved site plan where those trees were shown to be maintained on that site, that made it a site plan amendment. So they couldn't just cut those trees without getting plan and board approval. But that's because they're a commercial site. There's something different than a single family home that's not otherwise part of a subdivision. We do have some single family homes right. that are part of a subdivision that have restriction on how much right. trees they can cut. They would also fall under that, have to give notification and come to the planning board. So now we're into sort of the third pocket of, uh, of property owners, which are the single family owners who have no other restrictions or haven't otherwise had to go to the planning board for any type of review process. They're basically, as we were saying earlier, at liberty to cut trees, but for certain limitations, Brian mentioned shoreline filling, what have you. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then the last piece of that was yeah, what are the other sorry. towns addressing? Are they addressing just commercial, or and are so they addressing what, the whole ball What we looked at was site plan review standards. Okay. I, I, I am not aware of any other communities that require 
someone who owns just a single family lot to notify abutters for anything they're doing, whether it's just getting a permit for a shed, a house, cutting. Right. Um, typically, that's not something. That, that may be out there, but it's nothing I've heard of in the past. No. Brian, I'm looking at Brian, he's shaking his head too, that I'm not aware. We're, yeah, yeah that, that's not common practice. Right. Not to say we couldn't, but not common practice. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So, because it was a site plan amendment, mm -hmm. there was no need for a butter notification. Had it been a brand new site plan we still for don't commercial, have we okay. still, we, there's still no requirement for notification. Currently we have no requirement for Okay. So something as simple as adding that something may I, have yeah. helped. There, there is. We don't know. It may not have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think it, 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 it's the interest of the ordinance committee to add language in the site plan yeah. review ordinance yeah. to, you know, three sentences. Right. If this is this is not a uh, yeah. a big lift to add into. Yeah. The, and now, you know, obviously there's been yeah. some other conversations that's been had, but we can. Because uh, I wouldn't want to. I don't want to put this on private property owners. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, yeah. but if it's part of a site plan or something, then I could. I would totally I would agree like with that. I would like to have planning come back to us with some sort of wording. Can, can I make a motion? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to make a motion that uh, we request uh, uh, Jay Chase and Brian uh, Crowd to come back with proposed language to uh, add a requirement for a butter notification uh, as, to, as described. I will second that motion. All in favor? Well, that's three. Unanimous. Four on the audience. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> he was falling asleep. That was a nod. <laughs> that was just falling asleep. Yeah, one, one thing I just want to add here at the end is that, uh, you know, in this case, we're not we're not going to address fully or in any part um, Mr. Misho's complaint, right? So, we can't. Oh, no. However, it, it, the horse it, is gone. You know, but... <laughs> However, he raised a, an issue, right. and it creates an opportunity right. for us to make sure we give the public a right. chance to yeah, find out great. about right. stuff before yep. they just see the trees going down. Absolutely. Changes. But thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Awesome. All right. What's next? My computer just went to sleep on me. Harmonization of contract zone processes. Oh, yeah. Harmonization. Mr. Hamill. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a harmonica to help the harmonization, but I will say that uh, thank you for um, adding these to the agenda, and uh, also thanks to the staff for uh, allowing us to take time to uh, talk about these two things. Uh, this also has a fairly long tail on it. Uh, it goes back to planning meetings uh, and workshops that uh, were related to uh, Piper Shores and some of the great work that Jay and the planning department have done to educate um, the council and the public on the nature of contract zones and our experience with contract mm -hmm. zones. You know, which is a, uh, even though we say we don't like contract zones, the <laughs> data would suggest otherwise. I know. And I did a little tally on a piece of paper that I've lost, but uh, we now, I think we just approved the 12th contract zone yep. since 1996, which was the one last night. Uh, for the Patriot. Uh, well, that was just first reading. So oh, okay. Well, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're on the way <laughs> for the approval of that. Thank you, yeah. Jay, for uh, keeping you honest. For keeping you honest. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> um, so we, we have soon to be 12 since 96. Um, but I did a little tally on those. Those were adoption of contract zones. And I think there were uh, a couple that were repealed. But we've had uh, 20 uh, amendments, 20, 20 amendments to contract zones. Right. So we've had a lot of contract zone activity, and you know there's likely to be more of that considering kind of where, where we are with development in the town. So there was a lot of discussion about the, the, the fact that the processes today differ. The process for... Um, for applying to a contract zone, it has uh, three phases and uh, I guess six steps and uh, the procedures for amendments to contract zones, um, you know, have eight steps. Um, the big issue, you know, that I see here and that we've discussed with others and also this, I've confirmed this with uh, Nick McGee and the planning board in terms of his, his feelings on this. Um, and Jay and I had prior conversations as well, but I'll, I'll you know, rely on him to represent his own view on it. But 
there is a, an opportunity here, uh, uh, I felt, to consider combining these two so that they you know, both begin with uh, um, you know, more public uh, involvement and input and notification on the front end. And at this point, I'm going to turn to Jay to help right. ask him to yeah, you know, yeah. explain in more effectively than I can the you know, difference and the, yeah. the potential opportunity that we uh, spotted. Thank sure. you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the main difference is so for a new contract zone, the first thing that happens is a joint meeting of the council and planning board, and there's notice to abutters. That's the first meeting that happens, and from that process, council sort of, you know, there's public comment, there's sort of a lot of discussion, and then council decides whether it should proceed through process or not. When an amendment occurs, the first step in the process is that the applicant comes to the town manager through town manager, town right. manager, and it comes to goes then to council for a, but there's no public right. notice at that point, right? And it's not until council has basically sort of said, okay, continue on, or right? Not, presumably continue on, that they get to planning board, and then there's public notice. And yeah. what we've seen is the most recent is right. the public has showed up and said, well, hey, you know, this is a done deal. Council's already made their right. decision. At, at, that's the perception. Sure. And, and, you know, I know council still has its opportunity. But anyway, you know, they feel like, the, you know, the, the cows out of the barn, things are already moving, and we're just, you know, yeah. now, now we as the public are being brought in late. Um, and, that, and that's the um, comment that we've heard. So I think as yeah. uh, Mr. Hample was saying, sure. is there an opportunity to bring the public in sooner? Um, and is that, you know, is, is really that the um, initial uh, or, or new contract zone process sort of really makes mm. sense even for amendments to have that sort of joint conversation? Because amendments can be, we've seen some amendments that are very minor. You know, right. I think one added the allowance for someone to do uh, to do hair at what was before a nail salon. That was Lucinda. Right. right. But then we've had one, the recent example, Piper Shores, which is, you know, it's an amendment, but it's on a, another 45-acre right. track of parcel and so on and right. such forth. So, um, right. so thank you. The, so the intent of this, the genesis right. of this, is really focused on, um, you know, trying to uh, make the process consistent, if not the very same for, for both approaches, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, it's it's not going to change in any way uh, the status of the current Piper uh, no. amendment, okay? Right. So, uh, nor was it ever intended, was that ever, you know, contemplated as, a, right. as an outcome for this. But we thought, you know, when we spot things that look like there may be process issues and there's an opportunity for us to tighten them, you know, with discussions and careful thought and, you know, um, vetting it properly, that this was worthy of us taking time and energy today to, to discuss and okay. decide. Thank you. Katie? Yeah, I would agree. I think the goals of, um, I don't know if you want to say define or clarifying or, the, or aligning, that might even be the better word, um, the two uh, would be a good and achievable goal for this committee to get to and also just that consistency because I think like there's uh, you know yes I agree it's not going to affect the current situation but one of the things we could easily define and one of the things that's been fuzzy water is um, it's really simple when a contract zone is on an existing ownership this is a piece of land that they don't own yet so uh, the question really became is it a brand new contract zone or is it an amendment if our process is the same then the flags are hit earlier um, and there's consistency. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so we're just basically, again, almost in similar fashion to the last piece we just took care of. We're just trying to, right. uh, you know, make things a little clearer going forward for the next guy. Mm -hmm. Jay, you're, um, you're the planning guy. You're the expert in this. I mean, I, I, I will tell you, I was surprised to find out that when they did the amendment, they didn't have to notify the abutters. I was surprised by that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, your thoughts on that? Any reason you could 
tell us that it would make no sense to notify about her? Well, then I would say. It's just, just, just not our thing. It just Make a motion, Mr. Hamill. Public knowledge is always better. So, That's what uh, my thought is. Yeah. So I, with that in mind, make a motion based to on that conversation, I'd like to make a <laughs> motion that uh, we uh, ask again for Jay's help, which we uh, talked about with Tom right. and also with Larissa to get the okay to do that, um, to come back with um, um, some concise and careful wording and perhaps even a single process. We'll defer to you in terms of what you think is best and also what may be uh, common local practice in other towns. Okay. Um, so with that motion, I'd ask that we put it forward. Uh, Second the that motion. Can I ask a quick? Yeah, yes. go ahead. So my question is my concern around the definition or somehow defining the, the new parcel from existing ownership parcels. Would that be included in the work that Jay's going to do or is that something in addition or separate? I think that's that's consistent. If we say amendment, what I'm hearing is you really want to sort of make amendments follow the same process as right. new applications. Let's let's have everyone right. notify a board, have council and planning board come together and talk about things. And if that's the case, then that would take care of that issue you're talking about because whether it's an amendment or a new contract zone, it's going to go through the same public vetting process. Okay, I see um, what you're saying. Yep. Um, and so I'd be happy to work with Larissa, and you know we'll right. probably you know work with maybe Don. To I'd be happy to help. You know, right. as we sort of draft up some language before mm -hmm. we get it back. Great. Right. Any other comments or questions? I have a question, just a yes. clarification, oh, yeah. Katie. I I think I might be hearing, and I might not be hearing. But are you also? And I think this would be a separate issue. <clears throat> looking for language that makes it clear when it's appropriate to ask for an amendment versus when it's appropriate for it to be a new application. Yes. I think that, so I think that those are separate that's issues, separate and we issue. can certainly come back, if that's the wish of the Ordinance Committee, we can certainly come back with suggestions about how to make that clearer yeah, for applicants. Because I do think that was where their confusion, I think that that was one of the and it caused some of the challenges in so this particular situation. If I may just ask a clarifying question <coughs> to uh, Larissa's uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. chair, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I guess, one of, and I'm not trying to solve here, but I'm saying one option would be just to have the same language and, you know, uh, or same process for for both, for the amendment and the application. Another way of doing that would be one process covering both amendments and applications. So I don't really know how these exist in other towns, but I, you know, I defer to the experts to find, you know, the best way to address that. Um, if you had one process, it would remove the need to talk about either or amendment or application. So I, I think that there could still be a space for better definition. So I think that one of the challenges that I understood from the, the Piper Shores thing that we're in this moment is this real challenge of this isn't an amendment. This is a new zone because it's on new land. And so I think that even if we have the same exact process for both, yeah. there is, I think there's a, I think it's a question of shared expectation. If an applicant feels that they are applying for an amendment, they have a different, perhaps, expectation as do their abutters as to what right. is reasonable to expect. I Whereas see. if they feel that they're applying for a new process that's going to, I think there's a level of rigor maybe implied in a new process versus an amendment. And so if we're still going to allow for the, the, the idea of you have a contract zone, you want it to cut hair now instead of just do nails, we are calling that an amendment versus, I think there's a space to have some clarifying language surrounding that while still keeping the processes similar. So do we, to go back to the original motion that yeah. was seconded. Yeah, I would uh, turn it over to, um, to Jay to help um, develop appropriate language as described, including the, the question that was raised by Katie and then expanded on by Larissa, which, which was the choice, you know, Basically with, with include the that language, in Jay's work. language. With your language. <laughs> okay. I'm always so you're amending, you're right amending the original so I'm, motion. I'm amending the original motion. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to I'd like to make a motion uh, to request that uh, Jay uh, and the planning team um, study the issue and come back with a proposed language that would um, address it, which would address both amendments and applications via a similar process. Second, if not identical. <laughs> I second that. Any so, other comments? All in favor? Okay. 
we'll tighten this up as we go. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. That's why we go. That's why we put it through ordinance first. Do we have a general gist? <laughs> Thank you, well, we have something and we're wrong, then tell us. <laughs> Thank you, and then, Jay. and then you'll correct us. <laughs> All right. Uh, item number seven, Larissa, I'm going to let you. We were waiting for you to come back. I'm sorry. Yes. That's okay. Please do accept my apologies for missing last month's meeting. It was bad timing. I certainly did not intend to do so. Um, so yeah, the purchasing policy, uh, last year's audit, this year's audit, of course, was beautiful and clean and no um, administrative comments, but last year's audit, one of the things that they, they asked us to look at was updating our purchasing policy. And since one of the titles I hold is your purchasing agent, um, that's what I've done. And uh, it's, so um, some of the, the, I sent it out to the department heads. I said, hey guys, just so you can all remember, this is the purchasing policy that we're supposed to be following. Can you guys give me your feedback about parts of this policy that you think are working well for you, that you don't think are working well for you, and areas where you would like to see new language? Mm -hmm. So the changes that are specified in the policy, that you see proposed in the policy, are feedback from the people that are using the policy directly. So one of the things that we identified was um, in the definitions, you'll see that I've, I've suggested striking the language about approved vendors. We just, that is simply a, a practice that is not really um, viable in this age of online ordering and we have just having a list of approved vendors that confine our department heads to only purchasing from a few people is not in our fiscal best interest. So um, we are suggesting to eliminate that language so that, um, so especially like our public works department, I don't know if you've had a chance to go down and see their stock room, really an amazing place. It's basically like our own little Napa in there. and. <laughs> That is made possible and at such a great cost and because of Andy's great work at finding the lowest cost for each item and he's all over the map when it comes to vendors. So that is being suggested to be um, struck. And then I'm suggesting a few increases to just for some um, reasonable ease of access for our staff when they're out buying things. So at the moment, people have the authority to make what are called field purchases and that's if um, the you know, a department needs something that day that they haven't had a chance to, to order for, and they send with their town-issued credit card with an eligible-only staff member that's been vetted. We don't just right. pass it out to anybody, right? They can go and purchase something at Sam's or at the grocery store or whatever, and currently we have a limit of $250 on that. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that 500 is a really much more reasonable amount for us to, we still have control over what people are buying and who has access to that buying, but 500 is a more reasonable amount. Um, I'm also suggesting that... Can I ask a question yes. on that one? Or would you prefer questions one point by point? Please do, yes. Okay. That's great. That's how I That's like more it. efficient, yes. <laughs> um, so on that, would there be any limit as to how many times they could do that? Because that changes the dynamic a little bit. So I think that the answer there is no, because the department heads are confined by their budgets, right? So there's only so much money that they have to spend. We have secure places in check. So I think that one of those concerns would be if you see 10 different $500 purchases, are you, is that out, are we worried about investment, are we worried about, but we have a couple of checks and balances there. So each of those $500 purchases is recorded um, where it was purchased, who made the purchase, what was on the purchase, the receipts have to be included, and we have our, our kind of credit card tracking software that takes care of that. They go through not only the department head, but then our purchasing specialist, Kim Morrison, she records all of those each month as they come in from the different departments. So I think we have some good checks and balances to make sure that we don't have abuse of those cards out in the marketplace. Does that? That helps, yep. Okay. okay. Um, so let's just kind of go, I guess we'll just keep if going down through purchases. So she's going along. Yeah. Just pipe up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you'll see in the next line, the next item, number two, um, this purchase of computer hardware or software requires consultation with the IT department prior to purchase. Sometimes our departments uh, decide that they need something and, and they do need it, but they will go out and they'll purchase it and it doesn't actually work, work with existing yeah. pieces that we have. So IT has just asked us to clarify that for everyone and make sure that they understand they need to check with IT. Um, the next one is going down to section six, competitive bidding. Currently in item two, informal bidding process <coughs> is allowed when um, <coughs> the total purchase price is less than 7,500. I'm suggesting that we can go to 10,000 on that. It, um, it's been 16 years since this was last updated and I think that that's a, a reasonable threshold for um, insisting on the um, formal bid process. Any questions on that piece? No, I would. I'm, I'm assuming, and I should, maybe I shouldn't assume. Same kinds of systems of checks and balances there as well. So well, they're they're also going to be confined by some of the, the same things. They are be confined by budget, but yeah. it's also a question of this is really discussing whether 
we go through a formal competitive bidding process right. or an informal competitive uh, informal bidding process, and um, just raising that threshold to allow for some ease of, of movement sometimes. Um, this next one again is an IT request that all purchases of computer hardware or software will be reviewed by the IT department. We're just really hammering that home that no one goes out there and does those things. So that makes I think that makes sense because you wouldn't want me buying whole computer stuff. Right. I would want. The next section me. is about the procedure for formal bidding. Uh, just a little bit of an update about how we actually communicate with people at this point. So the policy had called for posting on the bulletin board at the town hall. It's not actually a very effective way for us to post things. Um, so I've suggested language that we post it to the purchasing page of the town's website. Oh. Um, and then posting notice in the office of the department involved can still be happening, but that we don't need to worry about. And I've also um, suggested striking language requiring advertising in a newspaper with local or regional circulation. It's an expensive thing to do, yeah. and it's not actually all that useful. Um, and then I was asked by one of our department heads, we really don't have the real right to and should not be um, giving preference to local vendors, but we do want to make sure that we're reaching out to those local vendors as much as we possibly can and making them aware of, of bids that they might be eligible for. So that next section, in, uh, language in section two that's being suggested is to make sure that everyone remembers we've got local vendors and we should make sure that we're reaching out to them. How, uh, do, we, how do you do that, Larissa? Uh, so when, let's say that we are purchasing a, a new vehicle from mm -hmm. one of the departments, uh, the department head will work, reach out to somebody in Public Works to work up the specs that we're looking for in that vehicle. And then we will kind of think about which, vent, which sellers of those vehicles locally should we be reaching out to, and our purchasing specialist will actually send them an okay. email or give them a Okay, so they're being, mm -hmm. there is reach out going. Yep. Okay. Um, as well as posting it publicly so that vendors that we're not aware of have equal access, but we, we do make sure that we send out. Question, Don? I did have a question. Uh, so, Larissa, does that, the, how does this apply, if at all, to things like uh, uh, consulting services, that sort of thing? Would that be covered by this policy yep. as well? Yep. We'll with the there. same limits and that sort of thing. Yep. So if I want to, buy, you know, I'm going to hire a facilitator for fifteen thousand bucks, then I. You got to go through me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to plan to do that. Well, I don't think it's in your budget either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, Thank moving. You. Oh, you're welcome. Moving forward to the informal bidding process, um, again, we're moving, removing that idea of approved vendors. So, um, and mentioning the, the purchasing page of the town's website again. Um, and that's, that's it. It's just about notification. We're okay with that. Then we're skipping all the way down to section 10 to the duties of department heads. Um, that struck language is about the approved. Um, vendors again and then there's this idea of supply the purchasing agent with a list of estimated annual requirements of frequently used supplies therefore fostering cooperative purchasing that's not again because of how we are purchasing these days that's not necessarily right. a, a great practice for us to continue so I'm suggesting that we strike that um, and more vendor language in seven um, and this I report to the purchasing agent the following items beyond use, items being replaced or to be replaced, items no longer of use to department operations. I'm, it's not something that we have that we have done since I have been here. It doesn't seem like something that um, is necessarily a good use of our time, and I'm suggesting that we take it out of policy. What do we do with things that are no longer of use but could be of use to someone else? We sell them. Okay. So we do have a policy of sell, sale of tax of town-owned property. Mm -hmm. And so we certainly, like, if we have a vehicle that's of no longer of use to us, we have a process that we go through to make sure that we are getting good money for those vehicles. Um, and then in number nine, instead of regular purchasing, I've replaced the language with planned bulk or cooperative purchasing. Um, and that's it for suggested changes. Any questions, comments? Um, it looks like appropriate and consistent changes to good job. <laughs> Don, any questions? No, I, I'm fine with it. I just quick comment. I, I think it makes sense to kind of push the responsibility, you know, to the folks closest to making right. decisions following a, you know, strong process. And I think that it makes sense to raise the approval levels, as Larissa said. Okay. Yeah. Can I have a motion? I think our motion is to move this to council, if that would be a that would be a welcome motion. Yeah, I That's will fine. make a motion to move this to council. Second. Um, 
All in favor? That's unanimous. And then last, but certainly not least, traffic ordinance, which we thought was easy. It's, and it is easy. <laughs> it's easy. It's, it's never is, easy, though, is it? It's like a quilt, this thing. I mean, look at it. It just turned out. Uh, um, I did ask Sergeant O'Malley, I said, you know, while we've got this open, anything else you want to see? He's like, no. <laughs> just close it up, back away. He's like, this is just too much. So it looks like an awful lot of changes are being suggested in these first couple of pages. Um, really, it was just we took the opportunity to alphabetize the definitions. Oh, okay. So there's um, the only <laughs> new piece that's in there is the definition for on-street parking on your first page. It's your I was second gonna definition. I going to say where in. is that? Oops, wait a minute. So under definitions, you'll see all night parking, you'll see vehicles struck because V does not come after A in our alphabet, and you'll see on street parking as the next, and that's the only new definition being added in there. Street, I just say you got a typo there. I yep, think. I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got to figure out what those words are supposed to be. I personally didn't see anything in these that I had questions on. But no, I, I, uh, would, You're the we, guy with the uh, pine yeah. point questions. Yeah, and I think <laughs> we vetted that, you know, well, and I appreciate the opportunity that we took to do that. Um, um, but I am still, I would say, really struggling with the way the wording is on Section 25, um, uh, a Roman one, number one, it's just the way that's wording, and it could be my woolly-headedness, I'm just having a hard time. I know we spent a lot of time talking about this, but um, this does, the way it's written still seems to contradict you know, lang other language in the, in the ordinance. Plus other language. And I think, I'm guessing that this is because things were added at different times and different rules were added and so it's not, the, the wording is not really consistent throughout the ordinance, uh, but I think it would be a huge job to try to do that. I'm not recommending that, but can you help me again, Larissa, on this? Sure. I knew you explained it to me the other day, and I thought I understood it, and I okay. read it again. And I, sure. So under, sure. so we're on page 13, section 25, parking restrictions, capital A, parking restrictions, Roman numeral one, no parking at any time. Um, and it says that, um, so, no person shall park a vehicle in any of the following places except when necessary to avoid conflict with other traffic or in compliance with direction of a police officer or authorized person or, or traffic control device. One, unless otherwise restricted in this ordinance, no all-night parking upon any roadway except in on-street parking spaces between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. So the, the idea here is that we've changed the language from street, and that means we have to go right. back to our so definitions, definitions, which, which is I apologize for. I, I know this is cumbersome. Um, but the definition of street includes all of the, all of the property that the town owns from the, prop, the private property owner to the, next, the prop, private property owner across the street. So it includes the non-paved, non-improved right-of-way. The word roadway only includes the improved surfaces intended for vehicular use. So by changing the, the word from street to roadway, what we've said is, if you have unimproved right. uh, surface that is technically town owned, right. but is in front of your private property, you may use that to park a car on overnight. Right. Um, and our police chief asked for that language to solve a number of challenges especially right. in our beach areas. We have very limited parking in a lot of those homes. We have a lot of people that um, are using the public way. They're off the paved surface, but they are technically in the, in the right of way, and right. they would therefore technically, according to our current language, be subject to being ticketed between 2 a.m. Right. and 6 a.m., which is not in anyone's best interest. So a little parking in the laws. Exactly. Yeah. I know down in South Carolina, the beach is here in Charleston, and it specifically says, <coughs> Um, no wheels on the on the pavement. So in other words, you can park on the grass, but you can't have any part of your wheels on the pavement so in those we, beach areas. Yep. So. so we think that that's what this language is, is saying. Yep. Is by, that roadway definition allows you, 
we, you cannot unless you are in a painted, clearly designated by the town of Scarborough parking space. Right. Park that your allows car. overnight parking. That allows, that allows overnight, overnight parking. parking. You may not park in those spaces. You may not park with your wheels on the pavement. Right. Between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm fine now. I okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we do go on to then, um, because we had some concern about um, some of our spaces, we really want to keep that 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. restriction on, even though they've been painted on the roadway, and those would be in some of our beach areas, because it a, a really becomes a public access issue. If you allow for overnight parking yeah. along East Grand Avenue, um, then people can simply park their cars there, and day-use people have no access to those spots. Right. So we wanted to provide an interruption of use of those spots to allow for more, more turn, uh, turnover for those spots. So you'll see in same section 25, but now we're in Roman numeral 4 under Pine Point. We've made a couple of, of changes here. For some reason, there was Roman numeral 4 and then Roman numeral 4-1. Not sure how that happens, um, but we've combined them into simply Roman numeral 4. Okay, So you'll see the, the renumbering as well uh, that takes place there on page 16. But at the beginning now of Roman numeral 4, you will see a couple of, uh, you'll see a new section, A, year-round. And what we're saying is that year-round there will be no parking between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. within the on-street parking spaces on Grease Stand Avenue. I think that we are working from an old draft, and I apologize for that. I think we have failed to update the draft that you guys are working on. So this it sentence, does say specifically this, from This sentence completes, and I, I sincerely apologize for this. This sentence completes... Um, I think we're still sometimes have some Google Drive challenges. I will oh, yeah. save different versions in, and okay. then um, great. So I apologize for that. So this is from the um, I think the language that uh, Sergeant O'Malley suggested was from the I think he might have said roundabout or, or okay. you know at I think actually he said Fort on East Grand Ave because that includes yeah. all of that stretch. It does, yeah. And then also on um, Jones, Jones Creek. Creek, and so the language includes those two streets where there would be no parking between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Yep. Yep. Uh, Within the on-street parking spaces, so we're being very clear. Green and Jones yep. Creek, that With makes sense. Radio. That's so there's no from or to there. There's no that's from or to. That's struck. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that's consistent with how it's been done in the past. Yep. Okay. okay, great. I'm glad we took the extra time on this one. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that Chief Moulton and Sergeant O'Malley were here tonight, but it was, you know, I mean, I, I know we're trying to respond to their request, but we want to make sure we weren't solving one problem and creating another one. I'm glad we took the extra time. Uh, could I have a motion to move this to council? Is that is that it? Or you oh, is this it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are also Sorry. Are spaces at the lower end of Pine Point Road from roughly Snow Cannon down to the... Can you... Uh, so I, I just wondered whether those should be seven are those covered. I think we talked about Aren't those, those. Jones Creek? Uh, no, no, that's the uh, Pine Point Road. That's okay. Pine Point AKA Road in front of the Street. church or the yeah, old church. Yeah, there might be 20 or 25 spaces yeah. along that right. Yeah. stretch, right across the plant bank. Yeah. So do you, we can certainly, um, I, I guess, I'm sorry, what I did mention to my geography of that area of town is not great. It's okay. So when I mentioned, I said near Bailey's, I, I think I understood, well, that's the Jones Creek section. That's right. But as you come over the bridge and you go down okay. toward the circle on the right-hand side, yeah. there's new spaces. And okay. Yeah. Nice so new shall trees we, we do to shall we add yeah. those? Those should be uh, okay. yeah, also. That's the intent. You should name the street because we've done that elsewhere. Jones so, Creek, so within the on-street parking spaces on East Grand Avenue, so East it's Grand Avenue continues up? Or no, Pine that's Point Road. Actually, Road and Pine Point Road. Okay. Pine Point Road, yeah. So this I actually talked about under number 15. Oh, there. Uh, I thought it was says, no parking shall be allowed on Pine Point Road from East Grand Ave to Snow Canning Road, except for within the delineated on-street parking spaces on the southwestern side of the road. And so I think Tom's question is, should we also include those as the, the, overnight, provision. the overnight provision? Yeah, I think those should also be excluded from the yeah, I'm not sure where it fits. I just yeah. wanted to observe that that's in yeah. the same area of potentially the same issue. I think, I think, that, I think that, that was her intent. Yep, yeah, we can fit it right there under number one. By if, if I may, if everyone can work with me here, I'm going to take out the word and between Where East Grand you? Avenue and Jones Creek. I'm going to replace it with a comma. And. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And Road. add a word and. Yeah. Um, Pine Point Road from East Grand Avenue to Snow Canning Road. Correct. Does that work for everyone? Yes. Pine Point Road to Snow Canning. 
and on Pine Point Road from East Grand Avenue to Snow Canyon yep. Road. Great. Good catch. Thank you, Mr. Hall. So does 15 become? It stays in. It does. Stays the way it is. To generally parking on the street, right? And it's a do it in different time of year, too. This but this, but where this is, we've added year round <coughs> here between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. only. Oh, I see, it's a tangled web. Yep, yep, yes. yep, it is. But I get it now. <laughs> the more you pull, the more you see. This would be a great <laughs> summer job for somebody, you know, update the clean park. up the parking. <laughs> I know, interns, get an intern. <laughs> interns. <laughs> Interns, say, that's right, interns. In the last three years, the same ordinance referenced um, locations, um, and it, it wasn't street pulled, it was uh, referencing a large tree in someone's yes. lawn. That that that's, that's not there anymore. Right, but yeah. that, or that, tell us that's something that 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 you know, it's 100 years old. So I love all that. Yeah. We also did make one other change that we didn't discuss, so I just want to make sure that everyone yeah. saw it. Um, in that same section, 25, it, capital A, rumor number one. Number 10, we are striking out the um, the <laughs> no, the no exemption for the one parking space in front of 19 East Grand Avenue, formerly Colony Motel. Yeah, it's yeah. long gone. It's been about 15 years. So, that motel. <laughs> yeah. so we're cleaning up that up while we have it open. That's okay. fine. That's that was good. a clean up we thought we could make. It All right. Work there. I move that we forward <laughs> the... Uh, Proposed changes onto the full council. Second. All in favor? There you go. Uh, anything else that we should be discussing? I don't have anything. I think we're at the end of whatever. I do. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Larissa. Just a quick reminder, we've got our two commercial marijuana information sessions oh, right. coming up next week. The first one will be on Tuesday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. The second will be on Wednesday from um, 2 to 4 in the afternoon. They are both going to be, we actually will have councils A and B open together, so if we have a large crowd, we can handle that. A um, couple of things that we'll be doing at those. So Phil Saucier is joining us for both sessions. He is one of our attorneys, and he's actually one of the kind of experts on commercial marijuana in the state of Maine. So the MMA has used him for mm -hmm. workshops and so forth. So he's, he's so. very well versed in this. Um, and he's been part of our conversation as a town we started this conversation as well. So he'll be here to answer legal questions that people may have. Um, and he's going to open our session with a very brief presentation about what the laws are that were passed and, and what the options to communities have. I will follow that with just a quick update about what we have done to date. We will have paper copies of the survey that we had available to residents mm -hmm. online on our Chromebooks during the voting. Um, and my hope that is that residents will take advantage of that time to fill those surveys out for us and I will simply input them as data into, they will still remain anonymous, um, but I will input them into the same, so we'll have all of that data together in one space. We also are going to have up on the screens, our um, GIS coordinator has made some very nice maps for us that just show where the industrial zones, the rural farming zones, and the commercial zones are in town, um, so that people can really see where could commercial marijuana activity take place so they can get a sense of what we're talking about. I think that people have a hard time knowing where those zones might be. And I've just ordered in today, um, everyone does love a sticky dot project, so I've just ordered in today uh, little dots and there will be printed maps as well so that residents, when we get to the part of the conversation about, okay, if you, if you feel comfortable with adult use retail stores, where, where in town would oh, you where would you put that? them? Yeah. So um, there are four colors of dots. There are conveniently four types of commercial marijuana so activity. Come now. So fun. Please do. There are dots involved. Um, and that will give us some uh, an opportunity for residents to actually say, yeah, I feel comfortable with this. Oh, and I feel comfortable. Like, I'm, I'm really great with having one of those shops at the Cabela's Plaza. Don't love it so much in Hannaford. Okay, so they can get a sense of where they would feel comfortable with those okay. two things. Um, so that's the kind of the game plan for next week. Right. Um, and then when we come back in March, I should have, you know, just more, we can really kick this conversation off in earnest. Good. Thank you for doing that. I have invited Eric Gunderson, who's the uh, czar of pot for Maine. He's a friend of mine, and he, I've got to talk to him again, but he was planning to come to the, uh, what is it, Tuesday evening, the evening one. Okay. So. And he doesn't he need to participate. He, he just wants yeah. to observe to see what we're doing and... Can we clarify that he actually is employed by the state of Maine? He's not just a drug czar. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, employed by. Okay. 
The governor's office okay. is the drug center. <laughs> Just want to make sure. All right. Um, hearing nothing else, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everybody.